Okay, we have spent the last three weeks reading some of the Bungaki Hyodon, or literary criticism from the great writer of the 20th century, Ishka Jun. And as I argue in my uh, forthcoming tome, these uh, works of Bungaki Hyodon constitute the most uh, perspicacious and lucid and uh, insightful uh, works of literary criticism of the 20th century, of 20th century Japan. And um, the first two we got through without much difficulty, but the last work, uh, Tanpen Shosetsu no Kose, or in my translation, what constitutes a Tanpen Shosetsu, um, as many of you have uh, been struggling with this work and have emailed me about it. So I thought I would make this video, and it's an abridged version of chapter six of my forthcoming tome. And um, there are copious footnotes included in the uh, original Chapter 6, I'm not going to read those here. There's about two or three footnotes per paragraph. We'll skip those, and I'm just going to read the abridged version of this chapter 6. So hopefully, uh, after listening to this, and I will give you access to the file as well after reading it, you will be able to make um, more sense of the essay and of his major points about uh, the longer span of Japanese history from uh, pre-modern all the way to early modern and then modern. Um, and it's a critique of modern literature, this essay. Tom uh, Bezos, and here's my essay about it that unpacks it and kind of explains all these obscure points that he's making and uh, kind of uh, clarifies them. Um, and I titled the chapter Ishikawa's Autopsy of Modern Japanese Fiction and Apophatic, underline this word, Apophatic Theory of the True Shosetsu. Okay, his autopsy of what exists and his apophatic theory of what should exist. And I began with three epigraphs. Um, by indirections, find directions out. William Shakespeare Hamlet. Epigraph 2. The Tao that can be spoken of is not the constant Tao. The name that can be named is not the constant name. Lao Tzu, Tao De Jing. And the third epigraph is from Marley Greer Ryan's book, The Development of Realism in the Fiction of Tsubo Tsuyo. And she makes the uh, kind of fatuous statement. Writers of the early Meiji felt it was necessary to break with the fiction of the past if they were to create a literature suitable to their time. They did not consider the fiction they inherited worthy of emulation. And, of course, uh, Ishka uh, rejects this view and explains in his essay his reasons for rejecting it. Okay, and here begins my chapter. In his seminal article, The Survival of Tokugawa Fiction in the Meiji Period, 1981, uh, British scholar Peter Kornicki provides an overview and critique of the prevailing tendency since the 1890s to regard modern Japanese fiction as representing a fundamental break with the fiction that preceded it. Taking aim at the, exag the quote, exaggerated literary importance attached to 1868, end quote, he argues that the transition from pre-Meiji to post-Meiji literature was marked by continuity rather than rupture. His article reflects the shift that began in the 1960s when scholars in both Japan and the West started to question the conventional account of modern Japanese fiction that emphasized a fundamental break with the fiction that preceded it and to explore the deep connections between early modern or kinsei and modern kindai literature in terms of language, narrative techniques, themes, and subjects. By the time Marley Gray or Ryan made the remark cited in the epigraph to this chapter, such views about modern Japan's alleged, quote, break with the fiction of the past, end quote, had mostly fallen out of favor. Writing several decades before this paradigm shift, Ishikawa Jun was among the first to challenge the standard narrative, and his essay, What Constitutes a Tampen Shosetsu, represents the most important and incisive of his numerous critiques. First published on March 19, 1940, at the height of the war, in the inaugural issue of Gendai Bunsho Koza, or Courses in Contemporary Writing, and included two years later in his, the first edition of Bungak Taigai, his major monograph, uh, published in 1942, A General Approach to Literature, the essay is at once a response to the key literary disputes of Bungak Rdonso about the shosetsu that were ongoing since 1890, a postmodern critique or autopsy of the false shosetsu, or to tampen shosetsu as he calls it, whose roots he traces to two gesaku fiction genres of the second half of the Edo period, and also, thirdly, a veiled or apophatic theory of the true shosetsu. 
His theory of the true Shotsetsu is apophatic insofar as it does not offer a clear set of positive or cataphatic statements and assertions about the Shosetsu, as past Shosetsu Rong or Shosetsu theories had done, but rather adopts a strategy of indirection and negation, circuitously evoking the outlines of what he regards as the true Shosetsu by describing what it is not. And what the true Shosetsu is not is precisely what he dubs the Tanpen Shosetsu which constitutes the essay's explicit or exoteric subject. Our task as readers is to extrapolate from the essay's explicit content, his account of the false shoshetsu, or tampen shoshetsu, its implicit content, his veiled theory of the emergent true shoshetsu. We can do this by ta- taking the specific points he makes about the two main types of tampen shoshetsu, which he calls the kant and the novel, underline these two words, he uses them in a idiosyncratic way, and there are key words in the essay. So the two types of Tampen Shosetsu, which he calls the Kant and the Novel, and reading them as coded statements about the true Shosetsu. As we examine each section, we shall keep in mind that Ishikawa uses the French literary terms Kant, short tales, and Novel, mid-length prose fiction, rather idiosyncratically to designate what are conventionally called Tampen Shosetsu, short story, and Shosetsu, novel, respectively. In his view, these two dominant modes of modern Japanese fiction are inadequate because they are reducible to what he calls zaidyo, or raw materials, hyul, or materia in Latin, hyul, hyul in Greek, a key term in his critical lexicon denoting the extrinsic, extrinsic materials that make up the, quote, conscious content, ishiki sareta naiyo, of most literary works. The task of the true shosetsu writer is to liberate the shosetsu from the sterile matrix of quote, materials-dependent literature, zaidyo bungaku, and to unleash what he called in form and content in writing, his other great essay of literary criticism that we've already read, we read last week, uh, what he calls in that essay the work's unconscious content. So the goal of the true writer is to unleash uh, this unconscious content, or ishiki sarezaru naiyo, to unleash ways of discovering or uh, unleashing this unconscious content. Next section. The popular myth, or zokshing, concerning how shosetsu are created. Ishikawa begins with the question, what is a shosetsu? Shosetsu to anarika. But rather than delve headlong into this thorny metaphysical question of the, quote, shosetsu's essence, he immediately announces that this is precisely the question I will try to avoid here, and resolves instead to jump into a simple consideration of length. In his view, all past attempts to pin down the Shosetsu's true nature, Shosetsu no Shotai, have failed due to certain fundamental con- misconceptions about the Shosetsu, and all future attempts to locate some universal standard form will likewise yield only distortions and falsehoods. Though he provides no concrete examples, he is, is alluding to the numer- numerous Shosetsu rong or Shosetsu theories produced since the mid Meiji period starting with Tsubo Shoyo's seminal treatise Shosetsu Shin- Shinzi, or The Essence of the Novel, 1885-1886, which helped establish Shajitsugi, the system of copying reality, as the default literary hermeneutic paradigm of modern Japan. Shoyo's treatise prompted similar attempts by prominent writers, including Futabate Shime, Moriogai, Natsume Soseki, Tayama Katai, Nagai Kafe, Fukume Masao, Nakamura Murao, Yoko Mitsurichi, Kobayashi Hide, and Takami Jun to construct their own normative theories of the Shosetsu novel. For Ishikawa, all such efforts were inevitably, quote, bound to fall into a never-ending spiral of explanations that ultimately ne- leads nowhere because they ignore the fundamental fact that the Shosetsu is a radically indeterminate and protein, protein medium that cannot be theorized or codified into a set of rigid formal rules. He seeks to avoid this, quote, never-ending spiral by showing how the Shosetsu is more than the aggregate sum of its primary representational content, or naiyo, more than a pretext or arena for the writer to, quote, hunt and gather raw materials from their everyday lives, and discoverable only through apophatic reflection and poetic praxis. At first, Ishikawa manages to keep his vow to avoid the, quote, boorish question about the Shosetsu's essential nature by focusing on, quote, what determines the length of each work. He dismisses the standard opinions, or kenkai as he puts it, that attribute length to the editor's request or public taste or subject matter. For example, he, quote, 
When the author's subject is light, the work will be short, and when his subject is heavy, the work will be long, end quote, since these, quote, tell us nothing about how shōsetsu actually come into being, sakuhi no seiritsu. He derides as, quote, utter nonsense, the existing shōsetsu categories such as tanpen shōsetsu, chūhen shōsetsu, chōhen shōsetsu, and shōhen shōsetsu, or palm of the hand stories, that classify works according to the accidental criterion of length rather than the essential criterion of mode of genesis, or shōsetsu no dekikata. The so-called chōhen shōsetsu, for instance, differs from the so-called tanpen shōsetsu not in quantity but in quality, as evidenced by the fact that, quote, while we tend to regard Fyodor Dostoevsky's demons as a chōhen shōsetsu or long shōsetsu, and Anatola France's The Procurator of Judea as a tanpen shōsetsu or short shōsetsu, nobody believes that shortening demons would suddenly transform it into a tanpen shōsetsu or that expanding The Procurator of Judea would make it a chōhen shōsetsu. We must never assume, then, that a mere change in quantity will necessarily produce a change in essential nature. Here, the two works are inherently different, and their differences have little to do with length. It seems our reliance on quantitative terms such as long, chō, and short, tang, to express sub- substantive differences has only added confusion to our conception of the shōsetsu." End quote. He recommends replacing this existing shōsetsu taxonomy with an alternative one that recognizes that the various shōsetsu subgenres are distinguished not by, quote, quantitative differences, but by the specific, quote, qualitative differences that stem from the, quote, creative process, or sakuhi no dekikata, and the, quote, methods involved in the shōsetsu's composition, shōsetsu saho. But here Ishikawa runs into trouble. To uncover, quote, the factors that determine the length of a work, the sakuhi no nagasa o kitei suru mono, he must first address the, quote, process by which the work comes into being. So sakuhi ga dekiyagara jisai jō no tetsuzuki. And to do this, he must first confront the common biases and misconceptions concerning that process. These biases and misconceptions, he explains, arise from, quote, a deep-seated popular belief, Zokshing, that the writer's only sources for material, Zairyo, are those that already exist somewhere out there in the world, that these available materials, Zairyo, are divisible into those that are suitable for a shōsetsu and those that are not, that the chief task of the writer is simply to track down these available Zairyo materials and then gather up those that best adhere to his own personal philosophy of li- writing, and then when at last the time, ri- the time is ripe and his blood hot, having waited patiently, sometimes for years at an end, for the accumulation of rare materials he has stowed up in his secret treasure chest to ferment and brew in his hand as a mark of his own interiority, his naibu no mondai toste, the writer simply has to call upon his linguistic gifts and transfer his stockpile into his intended, intended work, end quote. Iska singles out several, quote, old maxims of mimesis, that is, fashionable slogans and formulas that grew out of the prevailing myth that, quote, shōsetsu are the representation of everyday life, shōsetsu wa seikatsu no saigen, which he believes have led countless writers astray since the Meiji period. He denounces the, quote, obsolete Meiji-era branch of philosophy dubbed the Gainen no Shōsetsu, a term quo- coined by Shimamura Hogetsu in the mid-1890s to denote the recent novel subgenre that focuses on, quote, abstract notions or Gainen, corresponding to recent social phenomena, for lowering Shōsetsu to a mere journalistic, to mere journalistic report, reportage about occurrent social events and political discourses. He objects also to the popular view put forth during the Russo-Japanese War by leading naturalist writer Shimazaki Toson in 1907 that, <clears throat> quote, life is a battleground, and writers are, quote, war correspondents on the battleground of, battlefield of life. Since such a view limits the writer to, quote, an expedient instrument that mechanically transcribes onto the page that which, which he has ascertained in advance, a spokesman for who performs the tired stunt of reporting to the public that which his brain knows for certain, end quote. Stressing the need to, quote, draw the fundamental line of distinction between this kind of labor and the shōsetsu, Ishikawa proposes pl- replacing these zaidyo reductive slogans and formulas with an alternative model that is grounded in a proper understanding of, quote, how spirit, 
that is, the spirit that prompts the writer to creative exertion, is actually transmitted from the page onto the pen onto the page via words. ペンから紙の上に作者の努力が言葉で記録されるという実際上の手続き。The phrase he deploys to convey this alternative approach is, quote, thinking with the pen, ペンと共に考える。Which he first used in his 1935 essay on Montaigne's notion of virtue, after encountering the similar phrase, Penser en m e s u r e que la plume e c r i t e in Alain's 1920 essay sur le style,、uh, which is included in Systeme des Boates. If the Tom Pen s h o s e t s the quote Tom Pen s h o s e t s or false s h o s e t s is reducible to the raw materials, the zaidio, that are selected and mapped out, quote, prior to the pen. The true shosetsu comes into being as the writer, quote, thinks through the pen while venturing into, quote, the looming darkness ahead. Issun saki no yami. Ishikawa finds the, quote, mode of genesis, the shosetsu no dekikata, that characterizes the two main types of tampen shosetsu or false shosetsu to be the, quote, inverse procedure, the hantai no tetsuzuki, of that which characterizes the true shosetsu. By inverse procedure, he means a linear sequence of events that, quote, takes place prior to the pen, pen izen, and unfolds mechanically in the following four stages. First, quote, The fermentation of the author's amassed stockpile of materials, Saishu Sarita Zaidyo, and his own psyche, or Shindi, conspire together as he waits for some external impetus to prompt him to write. End quote. Notice how the impulse to write comes from an external rather than an internal source, and that the work's representational content, or Naiyo, derives solely from the raw material, Zaidyo, of immediate everyday experience. Next, quote, the plot comes into focus. But this act of implotment too occurs in a contrived and programmatic way that restricts the writer's capacity quote, to think with his pen, ten, pen to tomo ni kangaido, in a purely writerly mode. End quote. Third, quote, the motifs start to for- take form, but these motifs, and by extension themes, symbols, metaphors, tropes, images, are schematically mapped out and interpolated into the work according to perceived designs. And visual diagrams. And fourth, quote, having already concocted the blueprint for the world of his work some time ago, perhaps on the tip of his distinguished nose, the author finds himself in a state of elation, giddily admiring his own sublime artistry that has somehow managed to bring everything together in his hot palm that dashes across the page in frantic search of one fashionable phrase after the next, while making no real effort with his pen, which remains diffuse and scattered. End quote. Crucially, the sentient pen, Kangaido pen, the looming darkness ahead, Issun Saki no Yami, the author's effort, Doryoka, and spirit, Seishin, these essential conditions of the show sets of proper are all entirely missing from the picture. End quote. While Ishikawa's Bungaku Hyoron essays are generally marked by a high level of abstraction, he does occasionally cite specific examples of works that go beyond the limits of what he calls, quote, materials dependent literature, Zaidio Bungaka, and meet his criteria for the authentic Shosetsu. Two such examples are Mori Ogai's Tsuina,、uh, Exercising Demons, 1909, and Nagai Kafu's Shotaku, House for a Mistress, 1912. Which he regards as watershed moments in the history of modern Japanese fiction, works that reveal a new kind of prose writing that is not about anything external to the text, but rather that takes itself, that is, its own creative processes and modes of expression, or keishiki, as its primary representational content, naiyo. In his monograph Moriogai, 1941, Ishika hailed Ogai's short essayistic piece. As Japan's quote, first modern novel, Kindai Shosetsu no Hotan, on the grounds that it marked the first attempt to address the fundamental problem of prose writing, namely the question of form, style, keishiki, and content, naiyo, or the what and how to write, naniyo ika ni ste kaku, as he puts it, by transcribing the thoughts that occur while reflecting on a single word, the recent neologism, Shin Kiraku, New Pleasures. And in his Essay Prayer Norito in Prose, which we also read two weeks ago, 1942, Ishikawa singled out Nagai Kafu's House for a Mistress, a short portrait of an eccentric writer called Chin Chin Sensei, who spends his days scribbling out novels in a small, dusty, low city apartment that he rents for his mistress.
as quotes none other than the genesis of the modern Japanese shosetsu. Kindai shosetsu no hotan ni hoka naranai. End quote. Despite the work's prima facie appearance as quote the ideal peripheral haven for old school literati poets and painter calligraphers, that is the so called gentleman scholar ink guests of Bunjin Bokaka of past epochs, the work is in fact quote the single most indispensable yiping. A work belonging to the so called untrammeled class in Sino Japanese art in all Meiji and Taisho period literature. End quote. A vision, in short, the work is a visionary, sui generis work that opens a new horizon, a new beginning, an ein neue Anfang, while showing the inextricable, inextricable link between a modernist aesthetic and an anti modern worldview. Taken together, Ishikawa's remarks constitute an implicit challenge to the standard view of Japanese literary history that confers the title of, quote, first modern Japanese novel to Futabate Shime's Ukigumo, or Floating Clouds, 1887 to 1889, which for Ishikawa is merely an extension of the Ninjobon. That the two plotless pieces are only 10 and 24 pages respectively, further corroborates his point, quote, that length never mattered much in discussions of Shosetsu anyway, end quote. Next section, the Shosetsu's actual process of genesis. Having addressed the, quote, deep-seated popular belief for Zokshin about the Shosetsu's, quote, creative process or dekikata, Ishika turns to the Shosetsu's actual, quote, process of creation, seisaku no kate, if the prevailing view holds that the primary task of the shosetsu is simply to copy or trace sha, fukushara sha, shaditsu no sha, the spatially and temporarily, temporarily proximal things of the world, that is the jitsu of the world, the actual process involves the more active process of refining and elevating, quote, as he puts it at the end of the, uh, kajing or the fair one, that contingent raw material into a new symbolic configuration. In the following oft-cited passage, Iskar provides a revealing, if but oblique, description of this actual process that is worth quoting in full and explicating. And here is the, the passage, four paragraphs in total. Prior to the pen, all that exists is dumb material reality. Amid the phenomena of the everyday life, the writer and his neighbor are painted in much the same hues. But whereas the neighbor quietly goes about his business calculating and tabulating matters according to the expedient exigent demands of each day, the writer is fated to abide on a separate plane once removed from quotidian reality, where he is forced to, quote, think with his pen, pen to tomo ni kangaida, in a purely writerly mode. The tip of his pen is a kind of scalpel that severs him from all his various worldly connections, his inneng, hurling his whole, whole being into the unknown world of the work. I should caution that while some of these severed worldly phenomena may later turn up in the work, not all of it is permitted free license to enter. The words the writer inscribes soar far above the realm of his own psyche or shindi, where they eventually merge with spirit, a seishing. It is at this point that the writer, neither resting his pen to drum up some chic, chic, uh, chic witticism that he will then transpose smugly onto paper, nor crudely forging some philosophic truism to later winnow through the filter of reason, begins to think through the pen, unprepared and unprotected, on the very limits of language. Ikinari kotoba ni oite butsuke ni girigiri ni kangae dasu. To wit, the writer always starts off without knowing anything. As for those who insist on hauling into their works the rotten leftovers of what they have long known for certain, they should never be expected to carve out any open any new worlds. I bristle at the idea that the writer's task is simply to beam a flashlight on the existing objects and entities of this world and then quickly trace over them with his pen before the battery expires. Prior to the pen, the only thing the writer apprehends with any certainty is the thick murk, the momo taru yami, before him. In fact, this perception of murky darkness is the only immediate sensation the writer actually experiences in the course of writing. Thus, insofar as the path ahead is murky and obscure, the writer is never fully in control of the work. Or perhaps control is beside the point. The only thing the writer distinctly perceives is his own continuous effort, jiba no doruka, the aggregate effect of which is the world of the work. 
A common complaint about Dostoevsky's novels is that a new character will suddenly emerge halfway through the story, or that the work's main subject will abruptly veer off in an unexpected and unforeseen direction. But even in this seemingly strange phenomenon, there is, in fact, a judicious law at work. Indeed, every show sets a worthy of the name Masterpiece has charted this course. French philosopher Henri Bergson's notion that our memory exists not within the folds of our brain, but outside it, has long been a matter of course common sense to the experienced Chaucet's writer. For whenever a writer manages to churn out a few good lines, and all the more so when these lines contain a reality of their own, then the stuff embedded therein will sprout upward and on its, upward on its own accord. The constituent particles of the emergent world will cling together as if a magnetic field had formed along the trajectory of the writer's exertion. These newly amassed particles will then converge and participate with the movement of the preceding pages, and this aggregate cluster will continue to advance and accumulate, prompting further development. At this point, what good are those raw materials, those zaidio, that the writers had rounded up and stowed away in advance? People often say that the show sets is a living thing, yet it lives only within the accelerating movement of the work itself, a movement analogous to a sequence of waves. And this sequence of waves occurs precisely at the boundary where the outer darkness begins, Issun saki ga yami dati tokoro ni. Though in our everyday lives we are all prefer to have our feet beneath us easily visible, that sort of clarity is not an option in the murky world of the Shosetsu. By now, at least one thing should be clear. The writer whose knowledge, or Nishiki, of contemporary values in life, that is to say his Leben Shaung, or life view, Jin Gang, was cast in the enlarged proportions befitting a titan, should not be expected to tread with ease into the realm of the Shosetsu on such gigantic feet. Such knowledge must be abandoned before entering this realm. In short, all Shosetsu began at the portal leading, leading into the dark, Yami no Toguchi, and where the end too can only be within this darkness. The Shosetsu is not some convenient machine that promises to disclose some hitherto unknown model of the universe at the moment of its completion. The writer's creative exertion can depart only from a state of unknowing, at times catching a tantalizing glimpse of some speck of knowledge, at times abruptly disrupted before any knowledge is gained. Yet the fact of the matter is that the, this exertion must remain in continuous motion in order to perdure. The moment a show sets to ends is the moment the writer's exerted effort has somehow exceeded the world of the in-progress work and hit upon higher ground. It is as though the optical phenomenon that we call the Shosetsu comes into being while this effort spins about in orbit around the author's Weltbild, or Sekaizo, his, that is, his underlining pictorial conception of the world, probing for some yet unknown law or formula of the cosmos. The writer's own interior psychology, or Shindi, is merely an impediment that obscures and obstructs the perdurance of his creative energies and effort. And the less this authorial psychology intervenes, the better and purer the work will be qua Shosetsu. Generally speaking, what sustains the work of the world of the work is not the author's individual ego personality, or his Shindi, but rather this trans-individual substance called spirit, or Seishin. The writer cannot merge with spirit except by severing his own Shindi, or ego. And it is only through confrontation with the real that spirit can take shape and become manifested in the work. The only immediate sensation the writer experiences during the process of creation is that of the looming darkness that appears before him, Isun Sakiwa Yamida. Yet no sooner does this world of the work start to appear than a small strip of expanding light begins to flicker at each new inch of this dimly unfolding world. Metaphors, especially blunt ones, are best avoided when discussing the Shosetsu. But from a practical standpoint, I see no harm in likening the Shosetsu to a sequence of waves of water or light. The world of the Shosetsu is abruptly terminated the moment the writer realizes that his cognitive effort, Doryoka, has extended beyond the world of the work, and the length of the work at this point of termination is equivalent to the length of that single protracted wave of light that unfolds as the writer weaves together these tiny particles called words. And what better way to describe the length of, th of this single protractive, protracted wave of light than to say, recycling my earlier phrase, that it is determined by the particular system of creative organization, the seisaku kiko no haichi, employed by the writer in the act of writing. 
Though the specific patterns of these configurations are contingent upon a specific time and place, the writer can only become cognizant of these changing patterns by going back through his work once it is completed and surveying the traces. If you will allow me yet another metaphor, I shall liken the tip of the pen to an electrode that discharges a stream of electrons. For this should give you uh, some indication of just how difficult it is to predict the exact configuration of this volatile ex electrical field. And the kicker comes when you realize that this unwieldy thing called the show sitter is an even more unpredictable and unruly phenomenon than electricity. End quote. Let us unpack these four paragraphs. Iskar starts with the premise that, quote, prior to the pen, all that exists is dumb material reality. The, quote, pen is Iskar's preferred metaphor for the psychosomatic act of writing, the instrument through which the writer thinks, quote, unprepared and unprotected on the very limits of language, as he stands at the threshold separating known and unknown, past and future, actual and possible. By extension, the phrase, quote, prior to the pen, pen isen, suggests a world prior to the act of signification, which is, of course, a contradictio in terminis, since for Iskar, world or reality is not some static pre-existing externality that passively awaits mimetic replication, but rather that which comes into being through the mediational activity of bung, writing, or of symbolic pattering, of storytelling, of semiotic naming, Note how the movement of the, quote, sentient pen, Kangaida pen, is governed not by the author's conscious volition or will, but by the, quote, iron-clawed laws of the pen, pen or diho, a phrase he uses often to denote the laws of language and by implication the laws of the unconscious, which for him, as for Lacan decades later, is structured like a language. From this initial, initial premise, Ishkar posits the existence of two types of individuals, the writer and his neighbor, each defined by their relationship to the pen and its unconscious workings. Mizukara ishiki shinai pen no hataraki. While these two types of, are indistinguishable, quote, amid the phenomena of everyday life, the writer differs from the non-writer by inhabiting two distinct planes at once, the familiar plane of ordinary reality and the supramundane plane reserved for makers of poetic worlds. And it is only the lat latter plane that affords the writer the freedom to generate a symbolically sensible world out of, quote, dumb material reality. Crucially, Iskar regards this schizophrenic split in the person of the writer as a curse rather than a blessing, a burden that must be accepted as a matter of fate or shkume. The self-divided writer is, quote, fated to abide on a separate plane once removed from quotidian reality where he is forced to think with his pen, pen to tomoni kangaida, in a purely writerly mode. And what, quote, severs him from all his various worldly connections, hurling his old be being into the unknown world of the work, is none other than the scalpel-like tip of the pen, pen saki. The second paragraph details another essential feature of the authentic shosetsu, the recognition of the limited nature of authorial control. If writers of tampen shosetsu or false shosetsu operate under the illusion that they ex exercise full sovereignty over, the, quote, the world of the work, writers of true, true shosetsu intuitively understand that the work unfolds according to its own internal logic, shaped and conditioned by myriad material, historical, cultural, and linguistic factors that lie beyond, beyond the author's conscious control. In previous chapters, I explain how the dialectical tension between freedom and necessity, ideal and actual, and conscious intent and unconscious impulses played out in Iskar's early fiction, finding their resolution and concrete expression in the creation of the work itself. Here, Iskar illustrates his point by citing the case of Fyodor Dostoevsky, whose novels often, quote, abruptly veer off in an unexpected direction, an unforeseen direction, as if they were self-sustaining living organisms that think and move outside the control of their creator. But he is quick to note that, quote, even in this seemingly strange phenomenon, there is, in fact, a judicious law at work. Indeed, every show such a worthy of the name Masterpiece has charted this, quote, this course, end quote. In 
suggesting that this lack of authorial control is not an obstacle to be overcome, but rather the conditio sine qua non of all authentic shosheta. The only faculty over which the author exerts agency is, quote, his own continuous effort, jibuna dordyoka, the aggregate effect of which is the world of the work, end quote. Even memory is beyond the range of the writer's conscious control, Ishkar continues. He cites vitalist philosopher Henri Bergson's view that, quote, memory exists not within the folds, folds of our brain, but outside it. An idea that, quote, has long been a matter of common sense to the experienced show a writer, end quote. The reference is to Bergson's famous attack on the popular mechanistic idea advocated by uh, scientific psychology, founder Théodule Armand Ribot, and others that memory is a purely material substance localizable in the brain. In Chapter 2 of Matter and Memory, 1896, Bergson contended that man memory, and more generally the manifold psychic states that constitute human consciousness, are fundamentally spiritual substances that exist outside the individual as energies or attributes of the external world. In a similar way, Iskai eschewed all modern mechanist mechanistic systems that reduce spirit, seishing to, quote, dumb material reality, all speculative thought of shiso to instrumental reality, or dikutsu, the creative work of Sakuhin to the aggregate sum of its extrinsic raw materials, Zaidyo, and the writer, or Saksha, to a mere transmitter of immediate lived experience. Scholar Miriam Sass aptly summed up his privileging of, quote, the unconscious workings of the pen, Mizukara Ishiki Shidai Pen no Hataraki, when she observed that, quote, for Ishikawa's theory of prose, it is precisely unconsciousness that allows for the discovery of the new in literary language. For Ishikawa, the true locus of the work, and by extension the creative artificer, lies not in, quote, the unconscious content, or Ishiki Sareta Nayo, but rather in the unconscious content, Ishiki Sarezaru Nayo, that emerges organically and spontaneously through active submission to, quote, the iron clawed laws of the pen. The third paragraph introduces the signature Ishikawan idea that, quote, all shows it to begin at the portal leading into the dark and where the end, too, can only be within this darkness, end quote. The act of writing is for him always a wager. It carries no guarantee of knowledge, illumination, or discovery. It may or may not lead to some, quote, speck of knowledge, some yet unknown law or formula of the cosmos, end quote, it is driven and sustained not by the author's shindi, or psyche, but by the free and spontaneous striving of spirit, seishi no doryoka, which requires a suspension or sublation of the former. The constant friction between the two incompatible and rival forces of, quote, the writer's own psychology, saksha koji no shindi, and, quote, trans-individual substance called spirit, seishing, produces a, quote, small strip of expanding light, that emanates from the pen and radiating into the outer void, yami. But he is careful to distinguish this act of illumination from the romantic notion of inspiration, inspiration, what the Romans called a flatis, a breathing upon, and the, what the Greeks called entheos, literally possessed by a god, which downgrades the writer to a passive conduit through which divine or demonic creative energies are expressed an idea that we saw parodied in the mock epiphanic scene in Kajing. For Ishikawa, the true Shosetsu is the result not of some sudden rapture or Zen-like epiphany, but of the heuristic engagement with the unknown. In this way, Ishikawa points toward a third way of literary praxis that goes beyond both the classical principle of mimetic replication and the romantic principle of self-expression, namely the po poetic creation or disclosure of possible worlds that reveal themselves in the act of writing. In chapter 7 of Fugen, he formulated this third way into the general rule that, quote, the inspiration to write derives not from anything anterior to the act of writing, but from the act itself. Mono kaku to yukoto wa kyo ga waite, waite kara kaku no dewa naku, kaki nagara kyo o wakasu hoka nai. 
The fourth paragraph plots the initial moments of the show's such as Genesis, when the only thing the writer perceives beyond the pen is, quote, the thick murk before him. Pen no zento ga momo taru yami. Though this opening or tear in the fabric of reality initially appears, quote, murky and obscure, the writer notices that, quote, a small strip of expanding light begins to flicker at each new inch of this dimly unfolding world. Ishkar likens the emergence of this new or hitherto undisclosed world to three natural phenomena. First, it is like a, quote, sequence of waves that occurs in cyclical swells that rise and fall, quote, pre- precisely at the boundary where the outer darkness begins. Second, it is analogous to a, quote, single protracted wave of light that comes into view, quote, as the writer weaves together these tiny particles called words that multiply and expand rhizomatically until it, quote, is abruptly terminated the moment the writer realizes that his cognitive effort has extended beyond the world of the work. And third, it resembles an, quote, electro that discharges a stream of electrons whose quote, unpredictable and unruly nature demonstrates, quote, just how difficult it is to predict the exact configurations of this volatile electrical field. Since this cognitive effort always begins, quote, from a state of unknowing, what instigates its movement is not, quote, knowledge of contemporary values in life, but rather the gaps and lacunae therein. Any attention to the three types of raw materials, ideal that make up the false novel, or the, the novel, as he calls it, uh, namely ninjo, romantic passion, setai, social phenomena, and fuzoka, more as conventions. Any uh, attention to these three things, three types of zaideo, must be subordinated to this heuristic function, this leap through, quote, the portal leading, in, leading into the dark, the tsuneni yami no toguchi kara hajimaru. Ishikawa concludes his metaphor-laden description of the Shosetsu's process of creation, or seisaku no kate, with an, an acknowledgement that he has failed to disclose or uncover the Shosetsu's true nature. But as he indicated at the essay's outset, his aim has not been to provide a definitive theory or systematic typology of the Shosetsu as his predecessors had tried but failed to do, but only, quote, to give a brief account of the common quantitative measure of length. For him, such crude, quote, questions of the Shosetsu's essential nature are ultimately unanswerable, and the only proper vehicle for the, addressing them is the Shosetsu itself, which happens to be, quote, precisely that which comes out, which comes about from the writer's efforts to grasp the Shosetsu's true nature. And by true nature, Shosetsu no Shotai, he means the process by which a thing comes into being, it's dekikata, rather than the necessary and sufficient conditions that make a thing what it is. Next section. Ishikawa's account of the two main types of modern Japanese fiction, their genealogies, modes of genesis, defining traits, and ultimate ends. In the second section of the essay, what constitutes a tampen shosetsu, some thoughts on the term, Ishikawa offers a breakdown of the tampen shosetsu, or false shosetsu, that also doubles as a veiled theory of the true shosetsu. In his view, the vast majority of works of modern Japanese fiction are not shosetsu at all, but rather pseudo-shosetsu, or what he dubs tampen shosetsu, which he divides into two main types that he calls nouvelle and kant, and traces to two gesaku genres of the early modern period. He tentatively defines the nouvelle as, quote, that sentimental literary form which aims to give readers some emotional lease release by organizing shards of romantic passions, ninjo, and social mores, fuzoko, into a concrete visual pattern that reflects a consciousness of everyday domestic life. Ninjo fuzoko no danpen o emoyo ni seiri shite, seikatsu ishiki ni tsukami awase nagara hito o shinmi saseta garu mono. Notice how the female gendered operative terms here, emotional release, romantic passions, social mores, concrete visual patterns, and consciousness of everyday domestic life coincide with standard descriptions of ninjo-born sentimental fiction, see below, and also with Shoyo's, Tsubot Shoyo's well-known thesis that, quote, the novel's essence consists in romantic passions followed by social conditions and mores. 
小説の首脳は人情なり世帯風俗これに次ぐ石川 tentatively defines the cunt as quote that literary form which aims to induce a shudder in readers by spinning a strange impromptu idea into a plot that cleverly outwits the conventional view of life 多少とも奇抜な思いつきを話しの筋に生かして地上図の裏を描きながら人をひやりとさせたがるもの。Notice how the male gendered core terms here are consistent with the standard definitions of the cont as a carefully constructed story consisting of casually related events, causally related events that move inexorably toward a final climax. Crucially, Ishikawa's description of these two major strands of modern Japanese fiction departs from standard accounts not in his definitions but in his nomenclature and genealogy. He uproots the terms cont and novel from their origin in the French medieval verse forms Breton, Lay, and Fableau and transplants them to the field of Japanese literary history, specifically to the genealogical line. That he sees as originating in quote, the various genres of soft erotic literature, Nambungaku, of the latter half of the Edo period. Though he provides no explanation, we should recall that Nambungaku, literally, literally soft literature, is an umbrella term invented in the Meiji period and retroactively applied to the various popular gesaku, or lit,、uh, playful writing. Genres that proliferated in the second half of the Edo period. We should also note that the term Gesaku has its roots in ancient China and has been used in Japan ever since the celebrated polymath,、uh, the great writer, botanist, inventor, scholar Hiraga, Hiraga Gennai, applied the term in 1770 to designate the various ludic prose genres that emerged after 1750, namely the Sharebon. Urbane books set in the pleasure quarters, Dangibon, satirical sermons, Hachimonjia books, Kibyoshi, or yellow covered comic books, Ninjobon, sentimental fiction, Gokang, bound volume illustrated romances, and Kokkebon, comical narratives. Of these diverse genres, Ishikawa singled out the male oriented Sharebon, the stylish books, and the female oriented Ninjobon, the books of feeling. As the most significant from the standpoint of modern Japanese literature, since they alone persisted into the 20th century. The Sharebon fizzled out in the wake of senior shogunal counselor Matsudaira Sadanova's Kansei reforms of the 1787 to 1793, only to return a century later in the form of the modern cont or short story. While the Ninjo Bone was, quote, the only genre of the Edo period that managed to survive unbroken up to the present day, doing so, quote, by obstinately swimming along in the undercurrent of Meiji literature and then more recently by residing in some dank corner of our ill formed modern literature that prides itself on how far it has evolved, quote, end quote. All other Gesaku genres either died out or were, quote, absorbed into the new genre of the Ninjo Bone. Which eventually morphed into the modern novel, novel. As we explore this section, we shall keep in mind that the implicit or esoteric subject of Ishikawa's description of the two main types of Tanpen Shosetsu or Ersatz Shosetsu is his veiled notion of the true Shosetsu, the lineaments and contours of which can be gleaned by inverting his assertions about the former. <clears throat> Ishikawa's Anatomy of the Novel. Ishikawa conceives the history of the putative modern Japanese shosetsu, which is redubbed and demoted to the status of nouvelle, as a diachronic process that, quote, developed through four phases the ninjo bon romances of the late Edo period, the so called model, model literature, model of Bungaku, of the Ken Yusha school, the quasi naturalist works, and finally the so called watakushi shosetsu, or I novel. While each phase, end quote, while each phase superseded the Preceding one by bringing out and refining its latent potentialities, producing a steady expansion in quote, variety in scope and scope, zatta ni natta, and evolution in technical skills of its author, saksha no gidetsu ga koumyo ni natta, and a diversification in range of lengths, nanto naku nagai no mo ari, mijikai no mo ari. 
they nevertheless re remain firmly ensconced within the Ninjobon framework. Ishkar sees the three phases that grew out of the Ninjobon as sharing with their progenitor the same basic constitution, namely convoluted plots involving stock characters, feckless man, jealous woman, conniving knave, whose domestic conflicts and romantic entanglements drama dramatize the aporic tension between Giri, social obligations, and Ninjo, romantic passions, but differing in their specific treatments and arrangements of those fixed materials and themes. To understand how this basic Ninjobon constitution came to form the basis of the modern novel or false shosetsu, let us review its origin in, and development. The Nam Bungaku or soft bungaku, soft literature genre known as the Ninjo Bon, the Books of Feelings, first emerged in the early 19th century and achieved widespread popularity in the 1820s and 30s with the works of Tamenaga Shunsei, whose Shun Shoku Ume Go Goyomi, or Intimations of Spring, the Plum Calendar, 1832-3, is often regarded as the Ninjo Bon genre's apotheosis. If the less sentimental Sharebon had aimed to equip its male readers, readers with the qualities of iki, stylishness, detachment, and tsu, erotic sophistication, connoisseurship, needed for success in the pleasure quarters, often by depicting the negative example of the hankatsu, or half-baked sophisticate who lacked those qualities, the ninja bomb, by contrast, sought to provide its female readers, quote, some emotional relief, shimiri sasetagaru, by portraying domestic conflicts and rival, rivalrous love tri uh, triangles while avoiding the kind of licentious elements and overt eroticism that led to the banning of its predecessor during the Kansei reforms. The Sharebon, you'll remember, was banned during the Kansei reforms. Aside from a brief crackdown during the Tempo reforms of 1841-43, to 43, this strategy of safety through sentiment helped to preserve the form into the Meiji period where it would be picked up by the Ken Yusha writers and recast into the popular tearjerkers and model novels or model shows that mark the second stage of, the, of Ishikawa's novel genealogy. Ishikawa attributes the Ninjobon's survival less to strategic st considerations on the part of authors or publishers than to four general factors. Quote, First, its own historical era was close to ours. Second, its influence as a popular form was still making itself felt in the late Edo period. Third, the, quote, romantic passions of Ninjo and social mores and manners, Fuzoka, that constitute its main zaido or materials, including in particular the language it employed, were still alive in Me early Meiji. And fourth, the Libin Shaong, or life view, Jinsei Khan, of its writers closely resembled that of the Ken Yusha school of the Meiji period, end quote. Note again how Ishikawa's conception of modern Japanese literary history carries an implicit rejection of the consensus view that sees a definitive break at Meiji. Several decades later, incidentally, Donald Keane would echo Ishikawa's view when he acknowledged that Tamenaga Shunsei's Shunshoku Umegoyomi is, quote, so closely connected in mood and atmosphere with the subsequent Japanese literature describing the demimonde, the novels of the Ken Yusha group of Nagai, Kafu, and others, that it seems more like a bridge to later fiction than a work bound by language and outlook to 1830, end Keen quote. Despite Keen's earlier conviction that, quote, the Japanese novel in the early 19th century had dropped to its lowest level, Keen eventually came to recognize that the Ninja Bones, quote, influence exerted on later Japanese fiction was greater than that of any other variety of Gesaku writing, end quote. Ishikawa traces the second moment in the history of the Japanese nouvelle to the Ken Yusha, the Friends of the Inkstone, the influential literary coterie founded in May 1885 by Ozaki Koyo, Yamada Bimyo, Muroka Kyuka, and Ishibashi Shiang, which effectively served as Bundan headquarters during mid-Meiji, lasting until Koyo's early death in 1903. Tsubo Shoyo, whose treatise uh, Shose Shinzi treatise spurred the group's embrace of realism, famously described the group as Japan's Ryozan Paku, alluding to the legendary Mount Liang of the Song Dynasty depicted in the classic mid-14th century Chinese novel Water Margin, where bands of ambitious warriors would gather.
Iskar regards the group as historically significant for several reasons. First, they ensured the Ninjabon survival by serving as a mediating bridge between Edo Gesaku fiction and the newly imported Western novels. Though he does not elaborate, he is referring to how the group's principal members integrated Gesaku materials and themes into their work after being introduced in the late 1880s to the Ukiyo Zoshi, a floating world novellas of Ihara Saikaku, by noted collector and antiquarian Awashima Kangetsu, whose public readings Ishikawa would attend a few decades later, prompting the often cited Saikaku revival, Saikaku Fukatsu, of the early 1890s. The result was a series of hugely popular melodramas in the 1890s, Ozaki Koyo's uh, Ninin Bikunin Iro Zange, Tajo Takong, Konjiki Yasha, to name a few, along with, of course, Tokutomi Roka's Hototo Gisa, the Kuku, as well as others, that captivated female readers by combining the traditional ninjogiri problematic with new elements such as the corrupting influence of money on human relations. Second, Ishikawa credits the group with having, quote, marked the birth of Japan's truly, first truly modern voice, alluding to their being the first to apply the Genbunichi style, which was hitherto established in gov- government and education, to the realm of fiction, thereby replacing the mixed Sino-Japanese style, Wakan Konko Bung, and mixed Hilo style, the Gazoku Setsu, used by Meiji luminaries such as Higuchi Ichio and Moriogai. While Edo Gesaka writers had used contemporary language for dialogue passages, Bimyo and his cohorts were the first to use the style, the new style for both dialogue and narrative passages, showing an, quote, uncanny ability to compose the narrative passages, the Jino Bung, in a slangy vernacular that matched the dialogue passages. Bimyo's unfinished serialized novel Chokai Shosetsu Tenga, satirical novel on a boastful demon, 1886-87, is often cited as the first successful literary application of the new style. Third, Ishikawa credits the group with having, quote, self-consciously invented the, quote, life-mirroring mode known as model literature, modere bungaku, that it, also known as modere shosetsu, model novels, which, like its European counterpart, the Roman Aklef, blurs the boundary between life and art by grafting fictional elements onto real-life characters. It was this mode that would prepare the ground for the final stage of the Japanese novel in the form of the I novel, Watak Shosetsu. And yet, for all their stylistic innovations, and even though they, quote, flat out rejected the term ninjo bone, adjusted their main materials and backgrounds to fit the times, and acquired some knowledge of foreign languages, end quote, Iska ultimately charges this group, this Japan's Ryozan Paka, with failing to move their popular novels beyond the framework of, quote, the ninja bone love stories of previous eras. It is in this way, Ishikawa concludes, that the Ken Yusha writers were the true heirs of the literary genre of the ninja bone, a genre that depends entirely on external materials drawn from everyday life, Zaidio no Bungaka. Ishikawa locates the next phase of the Japanese novel in, quote, the quasi-naturalist works that dominated the literary world in mid-Meiji. This phase, sometimes called early naturalism, Zenki Shizenshugi, or Zolaism, Zolaism, to distinguish it from late naturalism, Koki Shizenshugi, or the I-novel phase, covers the wave of novelists Kosugi Tengai, Takayama Chogyo, Kunikida Dopo, Hasegawa Tenke, Arishima Takeo, Nagai Kafu, and critics Soma Gyofu, Katagami Tengen, who, under the influence of European naturalists like Emile Zola and, and Guy de Maupassant, held that the task of the modern novel was, in Tenke's formula, famous formulation, to expose reality, Genjitsu Bakuro. These writers continued to conceive reality in terms of Tsubot Shoyo's Ninjo Setai Fuzok triad, but they shifted the emphasis away from Ninjo, romantic feelings that had characterized the late Edo and mid Meiji works, and toward Fuzoku, customs, behaviors, Fuzoku and Setai, social dynamics, in particular the darker aspects of Meiji society and its modernizing project of civilization and enlightenment, Bumme Kaika. Though Ishikawa again provides no examples, he has in mind the notable works of this phase, Kosugi Tengai's Hatsu Sugata, Makaze Koi Kaze, and Hayari Uta, 
as well as Nagai Kafu's Jigoku no Hana, works that sought to depict in unvarnished prose the harsh realities of working-class characters struggling to adapt to modern urban life. Eventually, these writers discovered that they were better suited for lyrical introspection than for conveying the objective conditions of society in its totality, and they soon redirected their actuality, tracing gazes, gazes toward their own immediate experience and emotional life. Iska identifies the final state, phase and culmination of the Japanese nouvelle in the Watakushi Shosetsu or I novel, the mode of fiction that aims to depict the immediate experiences and private thoughts of its author in a putatively transparent style. As I gloss in chapter two, the I novel is characterized by a deliberate blurring of fiction and fact, a privileging of subjectivity over objective depiction, and a focus on personal confession and self revelation. In the Taisho period, the Watakushi Shosetsu Ai novel is splintered into two subtypes that came to be known as the Kokohaku Shosetsu, confessional novel, and the Shinkyo Shosetsu, mental state novel, each marked by a different type of authorial personality and lifestyle. The former, which the prominent post-war critic Hirano Ken described as the destructive model or Hametsu Gata is associated with authors such as Iwano Hōme, Masamune Hakucho, Kasai Zenzo, Uno Koji, and Kamura Isota, who would deliberately engage in reckless or disreputable behavior in order to acquire fresh material for their works. The latter type, which Hirano dubbed the Harmony model, Chowa Gata, is associated with authors such as Shiganoya, Ami no Kiku, Taki Kosaku, Ozaki Kazuo, Shimaki Kensaku, and Kajimoto Jiro, whose works privileged earnest introspection and self affirmation in a manner that recalled the traditional literary forms such as the Zichu essay, Waka poetry, and diary literature, Niki Bungaku. For Ishka, both types are deficient because they conceive a work's content, its naio, in terms of conscious content, Ishiki Sareta. Naiyo, and raw material drawn, drawn from daily life. Ishikawa attributes the rise of this self-directed mode of fiction to, quote, a new hermeneutics of literary material, zaidyo no shin kaishaku, that emerged, quote, in the second half of the Meiji period. Under this new hermeneutic regime, the three predominant types of literary zaidyo in the sentimental idealization, idealizations of human character, Jojo Teki Ningenzo, human feelings, Ninjo, and social custom, Fuzoku, came to be replaced with three new types of materials the everyday individual, Seikatsha, his psychology, Shindi, and everyday actual life, Seikatsu. As a result of this reconceptualization of reality in terms of the subjective experiences of the atomized individual, the quote, world of the work indeed grew dimmer and more cloistered. The father moved away from the old ninja-born love stories, end quote. Writers began to abandon the long-standing distinction between real life and fictional persona, affirming their new attitude in a, quote, tacit public pronouncement that said, quote, we hereby declare that the occupant of everyday life, the Seikatsha, who today both constitutes the main materials, ideal of the work, and more and more performs the role of the protagonist, shall henceforth always be identical to the author, and we vow never to fabricate or sensationalize when describing our own personal misconduct or conduct and mental life, end quote. What Ishikawa is addressing, albeit obliquely, is the oft-discussed inward turn that came to define much of Japanese art and literature in the Taisho and early Showa periods. This shift within the Shadetsugi paradigm effectively began in the second half of Meiji with the romantic poetry of Kitamura Tokoka and his notion of inner life, Naibu Seime. It then spread to the realm of fiction with the romantic sketches of Kunikita Dopo, such as Musashino, the Musashi Plain, 1898, and Sorachi Gawa no Kishibe, the banks of the Sorachi Gawa, 1902. Then it inspired the self-portraits of artists such as Kuroda Seiki, Kishida Ryusei, and Yorozu Tetsugoro, and finally it culminated in the narcissistic narratives that came to be known as the eye novel. The shift is often described in overly reductive terms as the inexorable result of various social and political developments, the collapse of the freedom and people's rights movement, the Jiu Minkeng Undo, following a series of failures and betrayals in the 1880s, 
government suppression of socialist and anarchist groups following the high treason incident of 1910-11 and the execution of leading anarchist Koto Kashusi, widespread sense of anxiety in the wake of the Con- Great Kanto earthquake of 1923, disillusionment with capital life following the Showa financial crisis of 1927, and so forth. But to my mind, the shift's immediate and direct cause is the literary one, namely the rise of the literary hermeneutic paradigm that I am calling Shazisugi, system of cop- copying actuality, that between 1885 and 1910 displaced the analogical modes that had long characterized Japan's literary and artistic traditions. Once reality, quote reality, had been stripped of its symbolic analogical structure in keeping with that modern planetary transformation that Heidegger had called a decade earlier the, quote, the worlding of the world, the Entweltlichung der Welt, writers had nowhere to turn their gazes but selfward and inward. Prior to Meiji, the central concern of every writer and artist was how to apprehend one's immediate world and experiences through the mediating prism of the sino Japanese literary tradition. During the Meiji period, the concern shifted to the practical question of how to depict the rapidly changing social dynamics, hetai, and behavioral norms of the new age. By late Meiji, the focus had shifted again, this time to the problem of how to express the newly discovered realms of inner life, with criteria specific to the author's interiorities, sexual proclivities, mental states, artistic temperament, and intentionality, sincerity, authenticity, naturalness, becoming the new metrics for evaluation. This renewed focus on atomized interiority and lived experience accelerated the breakdown of the traditional distinction between real-life author and fictional author ego, so that, quote, by the Taisho period, this newly forged brand of European naturalism was already beginning to exhibit hysterical symptoms as writers began to describe with increasing agitation and always in the first person the affairs and fits of their protagonists, delineating the locus of responsibility so that readers would immediately understand that this watashi or I and the author himself were categorically identical with the ultimate effect that such frenzied works would soon come to constitute their own independent subset of literature. As a result of this shift, Japanese literature was presented with a golden opportunity to partake in the great literary upheaval that was still transpiring in the West, thanks in large part to that singular invention that it laboriously forged, namely the so-called watakushi shosetsu or I novel, end quote. For Ishikawa, however, the mere substitution of one set of exogenous Zaidio for another set of exogenous nai- Zaidio, in this case Setai and Fuzoka for the individual's author's se- the individual author's Seikatsu everyday life and Shindi psychology does not Eo Ipso constitute a fundamental break with the previous stage since it preserves and perpetuates rather than transcends and sublates the basic ninja bon framework. In this final iteration of the Japanese novel, the writer's primary task is still to copy or trace sha, the stuff of actuality, jitsu. Actuality is still conceived in terms of shoyo's triadic ninjo setai fuzoka formula, albeit with the accent now placed on the thoughts and feelings of the atomized individual, and the impetus for writing still comes from external extra-literary sources. By redirecting their actuality tracing gazes away from contemporary society, setai, and social customs, Fuzaka, and onto their own personal lives, seikata, and inner psyche, shindi, I novelists had brought the Japanese novel, and by extension the default mode of modern Japanese literature, shaditsugi, to its logical endpoint. And it was precisely this endpoint that Ishikawa sought to overcome. <clears throat> next section, Ishikawa's Anatomy of the Japanese Kont, as he calls it. Ishikawa next turns to the Japanese Kont, or what are, or what are conventionally known as Tampen Shoset, short stories, which he seems is a kind of return of the Sharebon after a century-long slumber, albeit this time with a Western character and orientation. He excludes from his definition the myriad short prose works and genres of the Japanese tradition, citing as examples the, quote, relatively short Tsumi Shichu Nago Monogatai, Tales of the Riverside Middle Council, written in the 11th century, or the short Ukiyo Zoshi prose works of Ihara Saikaka, which predate the Napoleonic era by more than a century, end quote, 
on the grounds that they such works share little in terms of form and content with the modern cont and delimits his, his, sco his scope to works that came in the wake of Moriogai's landmark and anthology of translations under the title Shokoku Monogatai Tales from Various Countries, 1915, which effectively introduced modern European and American short stories to the Japanese public. In his monograph Mori Ogai, 1941, Ishikawa hailed the anthology as Japan's first and finest collection of Kant. Here, he insists that the work had, quote, the profoundest effect on Japan's most prominent writers of the day, while also noting that this effect paradoxically spurred a generation of writers in the, quote, opposite direction, that is, toward the more accessible and feelings-focused novelle, with the result that, quote, the centrality of the Kant's role yielded no fortunate results for the Kant, end quote. His subtle but radical point here is that the two main strands of modern Japanese fiction, the novelle and Kant, are not only in direct not only in direct historical continuity with the two main strands of early modern Japanese fiction, the Ninjobon and Sharebon, they also effectively mirror and re recapitulate the latter's rise and fall, or development and destruction, Keisei to sono jiko bunkai, as he puts it. For just as the Kant was overtaken by the novel after its appearance in the no early Taisho period, quote, the same thing happened, the same thing had happened to its progenitor, the Sharebon chapter, books of the Edo period, when the Shadebon of Santo Kyoden and his cohorts was likely likewise pulled in the opposite direction and absorbed into the Ninjo Bon, end quote. The crucial difference is that whereas the Shadebon managed to produce a handful of masterpieces, most notably Kyoden's Tsugen So Magaki, Shige Shige Chiba, and Nishiki no Ura, uh, the translations for the stylishly slangy latest Bordello, Russell of Pillow Talk, and a uh, brothel in the light of day, the other side of the brocade, uh, all published in 1787, 1790, and 1791. The closest its descendant, the Kant, came to a bona fide masterpiece was an essay, a Minzokugaku essay, by the famed ethnologist Yanagita Kunio called Hitotsume Kozo, One Eyed Rascal, 1917, which technically is not even a Kant. Ishikawa's prediction of this etiology of the legendary one-eyed yokai creature with the long tongue called Hitotsume Kozo would, quote, outlive any of those written by Akutagawa Ryunosuke, end quote, is a not-so-subtle jab at the great Taisho writer who is generally regarded as the father of the modern Japanese short story. In contrast to standard literary histories that spotlight Western such sources such as those found in Ogai's anthology, Ishikawa locates the origin of the Japanese kant or short story in Japan's early modern gesaku fiction, specifically the largely forgotten nambungaku genre known as the sharebon, the urbane fiction set in the pleasure quarters. This playful, erudite, and richly intertextual, intertextual genre emerged in the Kamigata region in the mid-18th century. Yamaoka Matsuake's Taoism-infused satire, Seki Fujinden, biography of a woman named Seki, 1753, is usually cited as the first, and subsequently spread to Edo, where it peaked in the late 18th century with the aforementioned work by Santo Kyoden. It began as a kind of imitation of 17th century Chinese pamphlets about prostitutes, but quickly evolved into a sophisticated hybrid from form that assimilated elements from classical Chinese poetry and philosophy, traditional Japanese poetry and fiction, late Ming and early Qing Chinese vernacular fiction, and Yomihon adaptations of Chinese fiction. Early Shadebon authors saw no contradiction in their twofold task of entertaining and educating their male readers. They entertained by rendering their, the flirtatious interactions between female characters, often based on real life courtesans, and their male customers, in a lively conversational style, kaiwatai, laced with witty jokes and clever puns, reflecting the fourth meaning of the polysemous word shade, namely wordplay. And I. Uh, 
I describe the other four, three, the other three uh, senses of that word in the footnote below. Their didactic content was not the usual encourage good and reprove evil content chowak of variety that characterized Neo-Confucian writings and Yomihon narratives, but rather intellectual and aesthetic cultivation through intertextual exposure to Sino-Japanese literary sources and subjects, as well as practical instruction for achieving tsujin, or suave connoisseur status in the demimonde by cultivating the aforementioned qualities of iki, shik, shik, and tsu, sophistication, urbanity, while avoiding the kinds of uncouth expressions of ninjo, sentiment, and attachment that characterize the yabo, the boorish customer. With time, the genre of cerebral charms faded as writers began to appeal to wider audiences by relying on recycled plots and familiar stock characters such as the fickle prostitute, the great connoisseur, the daitsu, the half-baked sophisticated hankatsu, and the unsophisticated boar, the yabo. Yushi Hogen, Playboy Dialect, 1770, written by Osaka publisher Tambaya Rihe under the alias Inaka Dojin Tada no Jiji, Gigi is often cited as the first and paradigmatic example of this second phase. By 1830, the genre seemed to have drowned out under the tide of Ninja Bon Koke Bon comic narratives and Kibyoshi yellow cover comic books. In Ishikawa's view, however, it was simply waiting for the right time to resurface in new guise. Ishikawa regards the myriad cont short stories that appeared in the wake of Moriogai's Shokoku Monogatai as inferior to their early modern antecedent for several reasons. First, contours assume that the world represented in the Kant, quote, is always the kind of world whose every constituent part, down to every last minutia and pinpoint detail, is under the, the complete control of the author. Though he provides no examples, he is alluding to Japan's most celebrated contours, Moriogai, Izumi Kyoka, Shiga Naoya, Musha no Koji, Saneyatsu, Taizaki Juichiro, Sato Mikon, Kikuchi Kan, Yume no Kyusaku, Uchida Hyake, Sato Haruo, Edoga, Lampo, Miyada, Kenji, Ibuse, Masuji, Kawabata, Yasunari, Kaji, Motojiro, and most importantly, Akutaga Ryunosuke, whose tightly constructed plots seem to follow Edgar Allan Poe's well-known dictum that every word must be written in accordance with, quote, a certain unique or single effect, and, quote, the uh, the one pre-established design, end quote. But this neurotic desire to bring everything under the dominion of, quote, the one pre-established design serves only to stifle poetic, poetic discovery, allowing writing to take place only after the, quote, safe course of his pen has been decided and mapped out from the start, as if wooden stakes had been planted to guide him along with its end point, its shoot then already fixed, end quote. Contours try to bring a sense of order and unity to the disparate elements of the work by inscribing harmony, chowa, into it. But this harmony, this non-imminent harmony, non-imminent harmony, is not, quote, the harmony or discord that the pen finds at the end of a long, hard struggle, end quote, but rather derives from, quote, certain ideas that he has tucked away in the bosom pocket for incubation and breeding, End quote. It is cooked up, quote, prior to the work's conception, avant les lettres, and, quote, never comes into consult consultation with the pen, but instead merely stands ready inside the author's brain, waiting to be called upon to lock the work into place, end quote. Convinced that, quote, any tampen shows it that possesses harmony is by definition beautiful, end quote, contours, contours fail to see that such mechanically imposed or contrived harmony has a del deleterious or corrupting effect on the work. The Kant's third and most serious defect, according to Ishikawa, is that it fails to live up to its own commitment to aesthetic disinterestedness. Contours fancy themselves as existing, quote, within or behind or beyond or above his handiwork, invisible, refined, out of existence, indifferent, parting his fingers, to borrow James Joyce's well-known description of the detached esthete, Yet their value-laden stories end up parroting the dominant moral conceptions and entrenched life views of Jin Seikan of the age. If early modern Gesaka was straightforward with its practical and 
moral messaging, Charebon sought to teach the ideals of Iki, stylishness, and Tsu, erotic connoisseurship. Ryomihon, Yomihon promoted the cardinal Buddhist and Confucian virtues and norms. The Kant, by contrast, takes, quote, takes a single moral of some specified content as his nucleus and then surrounds it with various shards of various phenomena from his life until the whole thing crystallizes into a single ion, fusing his chosen moral into each tiny particle of this world. The contour swells proudly at the beauty of the world he has created, and yet all the while he remains utterly indifferent toward whatever actual moral he has recycled and exploited for his own aesthetic purposes. Iskar's remarks, end quote, Iskar's remarks are directed at the Tambiha, or esthete writers, such as Akhtagar Dionosuke, who assert the primacy of art over jisekatsu, or actual life, while nevertheless relying on some jijun ready-made mor- ready moral, quote, to lend weight to their work. In Ado Aho no Isho, A Life of a Fool, 1927, for example, Akhtaga famously expressed his art supremacist stance in his assertion that, quote, life was not equal to a single line of Baudelaire, jinsei wa ichigyo no Baudelaire ni mo shikanai, a formulation that recalls Nietzsche's idea of aesthetic justification, aesthetis rechtfertigung, that alleges that, quote, it is only as an aesthetic phenomenon that existence and the world are eternally justified. For Iskar, such aesthetic posturing betrays an inability to meaningfully engage the world and inevitably leads to despair and nihilism. Iskar's implied broader point is that the Japanese Kant is inimical to his notion of the true Shosetsu, not only in terms of its essential properties and genealogy, but also in its uh, ultimate end. If the true Shosetsu involves the active reshaping and elevating, as he put it in Kajin, of given reality, the Kant's aim is simply to transcribe, utsusu, or represent, sai hyogen, that reality into a, quote, well-crafted est- well-crafted, end quote, aesthetic object that will reach, quote, the exalted kingdom of art. But since most contours are half-wits, quote, who cannot disguise the hidden thread, quote, hidden thread of their moral sensibility long enough to achieve their ultimate goal, their kyukyoku no mokiteki, which is, namely, the, quote, formal beauty and realized perfection of the completed work, they instead try, quote, to impress readers by arbitrarily postulating a fabricated no- situation that simply mirrors the moral prejudices of the age. The morals themselves are nothing we have not already seen. In short, they do not constitute a new discovery or a new of a new universal law, end quote. Having failed in their endeavor, most contours, quote, go insane like Guy de Maupassant, who you will remember, mad and syphilitic, cut his throat in 1893, or, quote, hang themselves like Gerard de Neval, who you will remember after living in squalor, ended his life raving mad in a sewer in 1855. Ultimately, just as its prototype, the Shade Bon, was superseded by the Ninjo Bon, the Kant, quote, appears to have dissolved almost immediately after it entered the post Meiji literary scene, as its innumerable scatterings of stories were soon swept away in the overwhelming deluge of novels. As a result, the Kant petered out without for- ever forming a single autonomous school. In the final section of the essay, The Realm of the Tampen Shosetsu, Ishka backtracks slightly from his zero sum claim that the Tampen Shosetsu, or false Shosetsu, and the emergent true Shosetsu are radically incompatible by adding <laughs> the crucial proviso that acknowledges an in- inextricable link between the two modes. The link stems from the fact that even the former contains within it certain, quote, Shosetsu like qualities, Shosetsu teki bubung, owing to the, quote, unconscious workings of the pen that are manifest in both modes. What distinguishes the two modes is that the former Shosetsu-like parts remain in an embryonic state due to the author's failure to 
submit to these, quote, ironclawed laws of the pen, these pen no dijo, which alone can generate the kind of unconscious content or iski sarezaru nayo. This suffuses and animates the authentic work. It is the active submission to these punitive laws of language and by implication to the laws of the unconsciousness, which are structured like the laws of language, rather than the desire to, quote, impose some preconceived lexical aesthetic gestalt onto that which he has already processed in his head as a unified world. That enables writers, quote, to think through the pen, unprepared and unprotected, on the very limits of language. Piecing together Iskar's notion of the true Shosetsu. Iskar ends his essay without offering any definitive or cataphatic conclusions about the Shosetsu's essential nature. But as he indicated in the opening lines, his primary aim was to describe the core features of the four Shosetsu, or Tampe Shosetsu as he calls it, while avoiding the trap of trying to pin down and formalize the Shosetsu's essence into a set of positive pro- propositions. And yet, as I have shown, his description of the Tampe Shosetsu in fact constitutes a veiled or apophatic theory of the true Shosetsu. Apophatic in far as it was conveyed not straightforwardly, as far as it was conveyed not through straightforward argumentation, not through straightforward argumentation, but rather crookedly and furtively, by evoking the outlines of the true Shosetsu, by adumbrating what it is not. And what the true Shosetsu is not is precisely the Tanpen Shosetsu, whose core attributes he has outlined in the essay. Iskar ends by offering, quote, a simple but practical definition of the term Tanpen Shosetsu, end quote, which denotes, quote, a middle realm, a chukan dyoiki, between the two separate domains of the Shosetsu proper and bungak, or literature, first of all, and any work that floats and sinks within that intermediary space, end quote. In short, the Tampe Shosetsu, despite its mis- misleading name, in itself the product of a spurious taxonomy that classifies works according to accidental rather than essential criteria, is not a Shosetsu at all, but rather a defunct relic of the sterile matrix of Bungako literature. We may sum up by tentatively enumerating several core features of the true Shosetsu that can be gleaned from his description of the Tampen Shosetsu. For Ishka, the true Shosetsu is... One, an emergent form that is broken free from the matrix of literature, bungaka. Two, unencumbered by length or space constraints. Three, characterized by Dionysian energy and spontaneity, spontaneity rather than Apollonian harmony and order. Four, predicated on the suspension or bracketing of all inherited jinseikan or life views and moral presuppositions. Five, beholden neither to the classical principle of mimetic representation nor to the romantic principle of self-expression, but instead posits the third way of literary praxis, namely the poetic disclosure of new worlds. Six, driven and sustained by, quote, the ironclad laws of the pen and trans-individual spirit, seishing rather than the individual psyche. And seven, unintelligible through the lens of pre-existing concepts, and the filter of the knowledge of contemporary values in life. And yet, even this provisional list of determinations that I have given fails to capture the Shosetsu's true nature, and so we are left to return to Ishkar's non-definitional definition of the Shosetsu. Quote, So what exactly then is this thing called the Shosetsu that is transformed, or at least seems to be transforming in this new direction? To date, no one has ever answered this question adequately. And yet at the same time, no one grapples with this question more intensely than the writer himself. Indeed, it is this very question that drives us to write. What we call the Shosetsu is precisely that which comes about from the writer's efforts to grasp the Shosetsu's true nature, end quote. It is this elusive figure of this true Shosetsu, a living entity and a discrete phenomenon, as he put it in form and content in writing 1940, that the writer pursues in the act of creation but can never attain 
precisely because its true nature lies not in the formal, quote, formal beauty and realized perfection of the completed work, but rather in its very mode of genesis, its shosetsu no dekikata. Indeed, Ishikawa's entire corpus can be read as an attempt to discover this elusive figure of the true shosetsu through creative praxis and through the cognitive exertion of spirit, the seishi no doryoku, which are irreducible to mere psychology and mere immediate experience. From our vantage today, we can see that Ishikawa's apophatic theory of the true shosetsu, which grew out of his theory of pr- the pure prose set forth in form and content in writing, prefigured certain ideas of the novel that emerged in the post-war period. French writer Alain Robb-Grillet his uh, Alain Grillet's notion of the anti-roman or nouveau roman, for instance, resonates with many of the ideas that Iskar had developed two decades earlier. In his 1957 essay on several obsolete notions, Robes Grillet argued that, quote, the point is to reduce the novel to a signification external to it, to make the novel a means of achieving some value which transcends it, some spiritual or terrestrial beyond future happiness or eternal truth. Wherever, if art is something, it is everything, which means that it must be self-sufficient and that there is nothing beyond, end quote from Rob Grier. In a similar vein, Ishkar contested this t- the tendency, conspicuous in both formalist and anti-formalist camps, to privilege ri- primary representation over secondary representation. You remember these terms that I gave in the introduction to my tome, Raw, to privilege raw materials as ideal over poetic invention or hatsume, and to privilege conscious content over unconscious content by affirming writing's inherent capacity to do to correspond and communicate. God points the way toward a new kind of writing that discloses possible worlds that springs together elements from the past, the present, and the future all into one nodal point, a subject that we shall explore in the next and final S chapter of this tome. I hope this has been helpful to you in reading this very important work of Bungaku Hyodong from 1940 at the height of the war. We will discuss it in more detail in class. I will see you then. Goodbye.